we have you here today because you wrote a book called the um the four essential pillars of boundary setting a practice informed guide to elevate your empowerment authenticity and self-worth and that is the golden ticket that's what we want to talk about boundaries this podcast represents the opinions of our hosts and guests the content here should not be taken as medical advice and is for informational purposes only this podcast also does not establish a standard of care doctor patient or client relationship no guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast or website and because each person is so unique All listeners are encouraged to connect with counseling and medical professionals for assistance with their personal journey. All people, places, and scenarios mentioned in the podcast have been changed to protect the privacy of those involved. Welcome to We're Not Fine. I'm Dr. Talia Jackson. And I'm Doug Jensen. We thank you for listening every week to our deep and thought-provoking conversations about relationships. Hi, We're Not Fine fam. Welcome to another episode of We're Not Fine. You're not fine. I'm fine. You are fine. You're fine. You turn lesbian straight and straight men gay. That's how fine Doug is. In case you're not watching us on YouTube, you will be now. Oh, goodness. (laughs) Um, And per usual, dear listeners, if you don't love us gabbing and bantering and checking in on each other's lives... Don't worry. We still love you. Just skip ahead maybe 10 minutes or so every episode. We usually kind of check in. But Is it actually 10 minutes? Do we actually just chat for 10 minutes? We to, do. We have so much to say because we only to catch up on and talk to catch every up our day. Listeners and viewers on. Yesterday, I called Doug and I was like, oh my God, it has been 24 hours or 48 hours since <laughs> I spoke to you. I don't know what you've eaten. I don't know. What you're wearing? I don't. What has happened? Are you? Do I even recognize you? And I feel like you? every time something, every time that happens, there's always a lot that happens. That's I know. what I don't love. Well, and I can't remember a single time in our relationship where either one of us is like, "Okay, I'm gonna go." It's usually like, "Oh, well, I've just arrived at here. I've got to make dinner." So we we're that's true. We're professional gabbers. Um, can I ask you a personal question? You can ask me anything. What I may not answer. In the bleepity duckity block happened to your face. I already know the answer, but I think you should know. Inquiring minds want to know. So I don't know that anyone would notice if really? you hadn't brought it to my attention that I look a little like Harry Potter with a a scar right here. I mean, you're looking more and more like, I don't know if I want to say Gandalf or, you know, you got like more and more scars every time I see you. So I did something I've never done before to make this as long story short as I can. Um, my housemate and I, who, you know, we have a ton of clutter. We had a ton of clutter from his life in the garage. We had a ton of clutter from my life in the basement. Well, it's been 30. Haven't you been there for 30 yeah, years? Yeah, 30 years. But, you know, my older is 35. And so I have kids stuff. I have stuff from my practice for 35 years. Grad school. Like, I just toys and things and junk and all that sort of thing. And we decided to take a week off each and just stay at home and go through absolutely everything we could. And we about succeeded we were also gonna have a garage sale which i'm iffy about because it feels like a lot more work but we were gonna have a garage sale got postponed because we couldn't even get through all the stuff that we had it was a crazy crazy week of going through like 50 boxes however related to my unfortunate face which looks much better today we should not post we should not post a picture of me while i was in urgent care um so we were upstairs i have a two-story garage my home is built in 1904 it's an amish built garage with like beams and whatnot versus nails and and whatnot but there was a two by four across the uh across the length of the garage to kind of stabilize a little bit but it wasn't a permanent piece of wood and of course my buddy decided he could swing from it and Mm -hmm. i was laying on the on the floor at the time and as it went down it crashed onto my face yes it did i will tell you and i apologize for anyone who is blood squeamish please just pass through the amount of blood that comes from a head wound, like I literally poured out my hands because it was, oh, wow. I couldn't tell what was going on. Like it was just f- flooding out of my face. <laughs> so the next yes. day I call my uh, 
co-parent who has also been an ER nurse, and she said, you need to go in. So I had seven stitches put here and one stitch put here. And I'm really grateful that it didn't like fall into my eye. Well, I I can't believe how quickly you healed. I I mean, you had like a black eye. I had a massively. Yeah, I couldn't open my eye. It It was was like glued shut. (laughs) I know. And And as I was like, is it? What's going on? What's wrong with my eye? My buddy was like, don't look. And I'm like, I can't look. You're like, do I still I have an see, eye? Because it was, it was flowing up with blood. My eye was, you know, flood with blood my, on my left side. And then, of course, it did swell shut by the next day. It was crazy. But I, I heal. Yeah. This is one week. I heal really fast. Yeah, you are you are um really more into rough living than I am. I am into rough living. Because I could like tell you about um, you know, a blister on my toe, maybe like a paper cut, but with yeah. you and your jujitsu and your wrestling and you're always like doing really tough, sexy things around the house, moving things <laughs> I, I like that you call it sexy. Two by, two by four to the face. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that I feel like that doesn't happen to me, although I do walk into things and I've broken my nose twice in my own house walking fast into things, as you know. I do know you walked into the glass door of your sliding glores, doors. I did. Glores. Glo- my sliding glores. Did you really break your nose that time? Yeah, I broke it twice oh. also on a pole in the basement. But it's like I, when I watch my 16-year-old. you have a pole in your basement? Doesn't you everybody? Dance? Doesn't everybody? I'm now, thinking about my, it now that we've cleaned up the basement. With my karaoke machine and the pole. But I think, you know, watching my 16-year-old who has very similar ADHD to me and watching how fast he moves in the world, not yeah. necessarily opening his eyes in the right direction. There's going to be some nose breakage. Yes. And he like bumps into stuff. His, you know, the belt loops of your pants get caught on stuff. You just... You're moving too fast and you're not paying attention. So that's me. You were lying on the ground daydreaming. I was tired. I was tired after some activity. So, um, yeah, I was, I don't even remember how much, but boy. Intense. Intense. And of course we tried, you know, he, uh, he has decided not to wash the shirt that he put all my blood on. Um, and yeah, it that's looks a really real gory. Angelina Jolie kind of and Billy Bob Thornton vibe. He is an artist. He's a tattoo artist. So, of course, he wants to keep things artistic. Do you have a vial of his blood around no. your neck? No. No. I have tattoos. You do have tattoos. No. Tell me about you. How was your week? <laughs> We're going to change the topic. You don't want to talk about it anymore. Well... I don't know if you guys remember that I was hurting a little bit after when we were um, interviewing our beautiful Melissa Rogers, our matchmaker. I was a little bit at death's door because I uh, did Rosé Fest in St. Paul the night before and then karaoke'd until one in the morning. Very unusual for me. So it's not rough and aggressive so that results in eye injuries, but it is oh. not great self-care. No, it well, it, at the time, at the time it felt so right. But so that was really so fun in the moment and so many regrets that when I was recording <laughs> early the next day. So if you're like, what in the hell is going on with Talia? Now, you know, I was doing that, which, you know, in an, in that's your life. That's what you, I, it's unusual for me, but that's just a Tuesday for Doug. Tuesday. Tuesday. Tuesdays are my day. But then also last time we recorded, we went to go pick up my 16 year old from his love Nadav joy of all joy yep. places on earth, which is Woodward in Pennsylvania. They just do extreme skateboarding and he scootering is a BMX. He is a freaking talent. I saw his Instagrams. I mean, the kid is you taking his scooter, going down huge ramps flying god knows how high in the air and doing flips and it's so funny the names of these things it's like double nothing front butter whip tail that's what i use for when whip. we do the podcast that's what i call what we're doing that is what we're the doing double whip the nothing front tummy tuck <laughs> tummy tuck half calf with half a splash calf of stitches in your eye lemon <laughs> okay peeps Guess I'm so excited what? about our, our yes, episode today. That's what I was you know, say. like seriously, there are topics that in the profession that we're in as therapists, 
come up every single yes. session in some way or another. We may not use the word, but it's about boundaries. Yes. And boundaries are kind of, you know, what we use for self-care. We self-protection, you know, when we're struggling phys in the physical and the sexual and the social and the emotional parts of our life, all of our relationships have some sort of boundary, whether we call it that or not. Right. So it's kind of exciting. We have an, a guest who's written a book. Yes. On the four pillars. Dr. Catherine Cleveland. Yeah. She is so lovely and has so much wisdom to impart you guys are going to love this episode we are going we to love also it. I loved it. we are rebranding boundaries a little bit because yeah. i think that for people maybe that are wired more like me a little more people pleasing a little more must be agreeable and there must be harmony we have some feelings around boundaries that they might be rejecting or they might be selfish or and so it's it's hmm. just dis discovering in ourselves what we even think about boundaries and how we feel about our own value system and how to speak it, how to prepare for the possibility that other people might not like what we have to say, um, how to have self-compassion, other compassion, how we self-sabotage. It's a really, really good episode. And like every episode, we hope that it raises some curiosities for you and some internal questions and some awarenesses for you. So enjoy it and think hard about boundaries in your life. Enjoy this episode. And we'd love to hear from you if, if you have any insights or epiphanies as a result of it. So enjoy. Always. All right. Without further ado. I'm so excited with this topic because really, whether people call them that or not, they are everywhere, as you know, in our world. We've all established boundaries in some ways, shape or form uh, in our lives. But we tend to think that boundaries are harsh, like off-putting and disconnecting and, and hurtful and all those sorts of things. But we're going to rebrand today and we're going to learn about your four pillars of boundary setting with our guest today, Dr. Catherine Cleveland. Yes. Welcome. 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 Thank you. Thank you both. It's very nice to meet you, Doug. And very Kyle, nice meeting you. It's nice to see you again. Yes. You. And I wanted to introduce you and tell people all about who you are. And it, I mean, we have so many questions we want to ask you because it's a very unique experience. So you are a PhD trained licensed mm -hmm. mental health counselor, deeply passionate about mm -hmm. assisting your community in rural and local communities in um up, did you say upstate new york by rochester west yeah it's south of rochester in the western new york region of new york state yes which is such an interesting and we'll talk more but you know doug is from a rural farm community and now men mental health is his world so we'll have so much to talk about there you also founded the cleveland emotional health um, LLC and developed the Cleveland Emotional Health Residency Program for master's and PhD level graduates dedicated to promoting distinguished mental health counseling. Amazing. So you've taken all of your years of wisdom and now you're going to start, tra you're training people in our field. Mm -hmm. And we have you here today because you wrote a book called the um the four essential pillars of boundary setting a practice informed guide to elevate your empowerment authenticity and self-worth and that is the golden ticket that's what we want to talk about boundaries i'm very excited for so many reasons but you know what i'm interested to in uh, and I, this isn't even the next question but I love when people have enough experience that you develop your own theory, mm -hmm. like the four pillars of boundaries. I cannot wait to hear more about how you got there, what you believe, and how you believe that these are the four four main pieces of it. But I do want to share, and as Talia referenced, I am from a rural community here in Minnesota, and I look back at the town that I grew up in, which is about 2,200 people, I think. Lots of farming, lots of whatever. And I really think about like what it would have been to stay there, which I would never have done for so, so many reasons. Um, but you know, the bottom line is that, you know, to be a therapist in a small community like that, you're grocery shopping with the same people, you're going to the same movie theater, you're going to the same venues, everybody knows your family, everybody knows what's going on for you. And so boundaries are really hard to maintain for people in our profession in those communities. But I'm very curious, not only how did you get, and by the way, a gossip, right? Like everybody knows <laughs> everything about everybody. And I'm not quite sure how that happens, but it does. It's a natural human instinct, I think, to be curious. 
Um, but I'm interested in hearing more about like your interest in rural communities and your experience with rural communities, but also how you came to become interested in boundaries. Boundaries. Well, um, I grew up in a rural communities and, you know, grew up riding and racing horses and always been around farmland. And in my early 20s, I married a, a fifth generation dairy farmer. Oh, so we, wow. Oh, yeah. So his family and they had, you know, crops, dairy, and we um, put a horse, you know, for race horses together. And we ran that business for quite a few years, over 20 years. And then he got sick and he ended had um, glioblastoma, which is a type of brain cancer. And then when he passed away, that was when I got an opportunity, long story short, to get back into school. We do some a second um, bachelor's degree. The first one, which is relevant, um, was in business and then hmm. into um, some like neurocognitive sciences and the psychology and all, all the way up to the levels and kind of being able to take that and be in my community, my rural community and work with the farmers, which is a culture in itself. People may confuse if they're not familiar with this thinking is that farmers are rural, but farmers have their own culture. So it's really hard for them. There's a bigger stigma to come in to get help if people don't know this it's one of the top industries related to um, male farming owners and suicide suicide rates are very hard amongst that population really yes so that was a lot of the research i did while i was coming up to school and just to kind of learn about my own culture and i didn't even realize that it was such a distinct culture until i actually started studying it mm -hmm. and realizing that this is a problem even seeking help is the biggest issue. So one of the things we've discovered is that being having the culture of farming and the background makes it way easier for them to approach me and come in. So it opens the doors for my community for someone that isn't just out of the textbook, academic, but they actually grew up and lived in that world. So wow. that's why it's so important and to honor my husband and his family to give back to my community. Beautiful. That's beautiful, Catherine. You know, two things triggered me about my own experience. First of all, uh, where I grew up in Stearns County in Minnesota, it's a very dairy oriented place aside from crops. And boy, I went to school with kids who had to milk those cows before they went to school in the morning and rushed to get on the bus. And it was just a wild experience. And I know you get that, but I'm also, and my family did beef farming. So we sold, of course, cattle for breeding and beef and whatnot. So here's Here's the other thing, though, that I'm struck by when you said the suicide rates, the farming crisis. I'm old enough to remember the farming crisis of the early mm -hmm. 80s. And I will not forget when one of my classmates father killed himself because his farm was going mm -hmm. to be taken away by the uh -huh. bank. Um, yes. I appreciate the nod. Um, I'm not sure how old you are, but I'm old. And so <laughs> so but that was a really important thing in the early 80s that happened. And it was devastating. And my dad was able to get another. He, he did a job on the side to kind of keep our farm going. Um, but it was a devastating time. So when you reference that, this work is really ridiculously hard. I think a lot of people have this fantasy about what growing up on a farm is or a rural community. We had horses as well. I'm not fond of horses. That's what's funny. I'm like, I grew up with horses and I'm like, I hate horse riding. It doesn't work for me um, <laughs> for lots of different reasons as well. It's a lot of work, right? So, but farming is hard work. I remember my, my dad and my grandfather actually took me aside at one point and said, no matter what you do, don't do this. So it's a really, and you know, thus yeah. I didn't, um, I've gone to grad school and, you know, obviously this is my world now, but really, really, um, uh, emotional kind of experience to what you just said and how great it is, by the way, I am sorry for your loss of your husband, yes. um, and, oh, to, thank you. and thank to be you. able to honor him in this way. It is, it was a while ago and it's always nice to be able to talk to community members that, that knew him and, and his, and the legacy, there is the legacy you know, that is so important sure. to these families. Yes. But and it sounds like that. you're in such a unique position to have this like doctoral level psychology background, which would make you this untouchable, probably bougie, mm -hmm. untrustable human, but you can reach heart to heart. You know, this experience, you've lived it. You've sounds like you've worked the farm, not just married into it i mean this is your culture and community too and you're using that platform it's pretty beautiful i had no idea i am such a city girl i had no idea that there was you know depression suicide mental health issues in the farming community 
I did assume there was probably a huge stigma about talking about problems or talking to strangers about problems or admitting that you need help. But yeah, that's news to me. Wow. Yeah, and it's, it's unfortunate because it's not just in the United States. And a lot of the research done on farmer and suicidality is mostly done in Australia. So that's a whole different area. But they have very similar farming practices to ours. And they're having the same problem. So that's where a lot of my uh, literature came from, was from Australia, to get the information. The sad part enough, part about it is in the United States, we don't really study this. I mean, these are the people that, you know, feed us and make our wines and, yes. and everything that's so important. And we don't really acknowledge that one of the biggest um, issues in the data is they're talking about um, the suicide completion, not the attempt. So we have no idea what the ideologies or the just the ideations, I'm sorry, and the attempts that are happening that we don't have the data on that. We just have the data on the completions, which is which is one of the highest <clears throat> in, in industry in the United States. Yes. Well, and I mean, let's bring the boundary conversation into relationships and into, you know, so our podcast is about mental health and relationships and that intersection of how one affects the other. And I'm just so curious. I mean, I think we Doug asked like about how did you become interested in the idea of boundaries versus maybe people pleasing? And what have you like, how did you get here? Oh, that's a great question. Um, if you look, the book is practice and form. So it's the, the private practice that I have and the patients that come in. And over the years, I've really started to see what's very similar that the 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 issues that people are having over and over and over again and then finding myself discussing the same topics boundaries would be one of them and then i'm like oh this is great i should write this down to help them so it's just in addition to our work together is to give them a guide so it, it turned out turned out into this book so that's where the idea came from, is that it is a common issue. Yes. And sometimes you don't realize this is an issue until you, you hear it and you see it and you're like, oh, and then they need a little bit more of a definition of it. Yes. Then a little time to observe what's happening and what some of the signs are that they're having issues with some boundaries. So that's why I thought it'd be a little bit easier to help, them, help everyone out is to get a really clear definition of what boundaries are. I think it's brilliant. I do too. I think, you know, the way that you said that Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like people don't always know that boundaries might be the issue and people don't know that they can set them. And then I think secondarily, it's really hard for people to understand how to set them and how to communicate that in a way that isn't angry, that is well received Mm -hmm. in the most positive way Mm -hmm. uh, or most effective way, I should say. Um, But, you know, I think we naturally believe that setting those boundaries, and this is what I think people struggle with, I think it's really hard because people feel like they're going to offend that person or they're going to shame that person or they're going to get a defensive response or it's not going to be this well-received experience. And on the other side, I think people feel like, do I really need to do that? I should be stronger. I'm being whiny. I'm being needy. I'm right. I shouldn't. uh, I don't deserve to take care of myself that way. Um, I'm cur- curious about how you see that struggle between those two definitions or those two experiences and how you get people. And you know, I have my own thoughts on that. Like I can ident- identify and I'm guessing you can as well. Like when a client comes in nine times out of 10, they're having struggles with people in their lives. Relationships are all around us, whether it's work or family or friends or, or romantic. Um, so I'm kind of curious how you get people to understand that difference between it's okay to take care of yourself versus being needy. Right. That's a great question, too. One of the very first things is if they're talking about a dynamic with somebody like, um, let's say it's an adult woman with her mother. And just to really recognize that that there are no boundaries there. And one of the first things you'll see is that there's a lot of frustration they're having with somebody, you know, somebody that they really love. You know, it could be anybody, it could be your boss, but there's a lot of frustration, there's anger and resentment. And when that keeps coming up over and over with a diff- mm. with another person, then we know there's there are 
there's an issue with boundaries. And it's important to know that we think that, okay, the boundaries are, you know, she's crossing or he's crossing my boundaries. However, they're not their boundaries. They're your boundaries to understand mm. that your boundaries for you, set by you, and that you're the one who crosses the boundaries. Oh, that is so, that's such an important distinction. I'm thinking about all of the couples that I'm working with where it feels like when you're feeling that bubbling up rage and resentment, usually it's about somebody mistreating you. But what you're saying is, if that's the case, first, you need to maybe think about your part in this, that they're mm -hmm. your boundaries. And maybe instead of always pointing the finger at the person who's crossing them, you have to think about maybe have I made my boundaries clear? Are they as obvious as they should have been? And what is my part in allowing it? Mm -hmm. Which is really hard if you feel like you're a victim of a dynamic where somebody is clearly crossing them. Yeah, absolutely. And then that's when the deeper work comes in, when we start to really look at like, what is it that um, you're in, what, what is it that you want and what is it that you need in your life so right. that we have to go down a few layers to start there instead of going, people start try to go right into setting the boundary with somebody and it doesn't work because they may be feeling selfish or they may be attacking or feeling attacked for all these reasons. And that's what this book does is it kind of sorts that out where to start. So we're not actually starting communicating with the person that we need the boundaries with, but we start to figure out what is it that I need? What is it that um, I can need to really have a strict set and concrete boundary? What can I be flexible on? What maybe I can't do now, but I can work towards in the future. And so this is more like in inner work. So the inner work has to start before we can start communicating with somebody on the outside. Which is like surprisingly terrifying for people. I don't know. Maybe it's like my wiring more than Doug's wiring, right? Because Doug mm -hmm. is so good at just direct communication. And if you don't like it, that's okay because we're going to work through it yeah. with honesty and authenticity. Yep. Whereas mm -hmm. I, you know, may fall into this recovering people pleasing place mm -hmm. of <laughs> I need our relationship to be harmonious more than I need my needs met. Yep. And, but there's so yep. much boundary stuff that comes up. So much boundary stuff. And you know, everything you said, Catherine, I appreciate. I think it's uh, really interesting how hard it is sometimes to really get inside, our, inside ourselves and think about what do we need? What do we think? What do we feel? What do we want? Yes. And I think that process, I always use those four words with people and it can sometimes take time. I, mm -hmm. you know, there have been times that I've had strain with somebody and I don't really know what I'm looking for. I don't know what the outcome is that mm -hmm. I'm looking for. But that can be the start of the conversation. But I kind of always tell people all of these feelings are normal. Yeah. No matter what you're feeling, it's okay. Acknowledge mm -hmm. that feeling. Try to figure out where it comes from. And this is where our kind of uh, psychodynamic work with people on their families of origin and what their learning has been and what their attachment style is and what their personalities are. That's right. All of those things come into play when it comes to what boundaries are needed or wanted or or necessary to function. And I kind of go down that functional and impairment route. Like... If people are not able to focus on work, if they're not able to get to work, if they're not able to take care of themselves, if they slip in their routine, we have to figure out what they need in order because that, that strain with people can be really devastating on one's mood and functioning. Absolutely. We have to start where people are at. And, right. and if there, those of us, the, those farmers backgrounds, yep. <laughs> all right, we can just say, hey, we can just go be more direct and more blunt and not worry about it as much. But if you're a kinder soul and like you were talking a little bit about, you know, being more pleasing, yes. that's okay too. It, there's just a way of getting to see yourself because being a people pleaser or it, it doesn't work well if mm -hmm. you don't have boundaries along with it. It's, it's right. a lovely trait, but if there's no boundaries, it can be very harmful for you. Yes. It's like you want to be really agreeable, but at the same time, that is inauthentic if we're letting people walk all over us. 
Why do you think we are such people pleasers and why are we so desperate for external validation? Is that your Except individual work? Are you looking for some individual? Yes, quickly. Um, Don't tell <laughs> anyone. Dr. Catherine, give Catherine, me. Catherine, let's double team her. Help me with my people pleasing. I think one of the biggest uh, foundations of that is um, coming up as children and in, in, is sometimes we're not seen, heard, or valued depending mm-hmm. on what's going on in our environment. And and everyone's is different. So as I'm not seen for who I really am, for I can give an example as myself being older was like I was told like you have to do this, you have to be this, you have to be feminine, you have to get married, you have to have children. And they were always fitting us, you know, the generation I'm from into a box saying yeah. this is the next logical step in your life, which was out of love and wanting us to be successful. But what they really weren't tuning into is like, well, what do you want? And listening carefully. And I think the younger generation of families can t- learn to tune in a little bit better and giving um, young people opportunities to explore who and what they want to become. But for whatever reason, if you feel that you were not seen, heard, or valued, then what we're looking for is that since we didn't get it from our family of origin, we're looking for it from other people, anybody. So we start to please. And then if I'm pleasing to you, you will like me. And in some places, some situations you may be, but in other situations, that's when people can become predators and take advantage of you because they see that. So we can do a lot of harm, right? Like a lot of harm delivered to us because we just keep pleasing and pleasing, looking for that validation. So it's not that we shouldn't be kind and considerate and take people's feelings into consideration. But again, without boundaries, there is just, there's no line that's going to be drawn where you can keep, feel safe and protected without changing who you are. Equally so, I think, you know, when I, think about circumstances and i know you really well um i think we have a fear of rejection or conflict or Mm -hmm. strain and we're worried that that's not going to go well it Mm -hmm. is difficult to engage in conflict with somebody so i appreciate everything you said i agree with you that it's a lot of times about that you know need to be seen and heard and and not having any experience with that but that fear that avoidance really comes from a place uh of of worry about what the consequence might be I think we worry we're going to lose those people in our life if we actually confront those people or it's going to cause this strain that never gets resolved. And sometimes it does, by the way. I mean, sometimes when we have boundaries or we tell people what we're thinking or feeling, they don't want to continue a relationship with us or be in our lives. And that's okay, too. But it's scary to take that first step. And this goes back to like, okay, what do I need? Is this to really do that inner work? Is this a person? I need in my life or is this a person that should no longer be in my life this is not for us to say this is to get the patient or the person to say this is okay with me this is not okay with me yeah you know and so is this person like harmful in my life and should they not be in my life or is this someone that is needs to be in my life and if I can learn to set boundaries with them they're actually going to start to see respect rather than manipulation and authenticity because i think that a lot of times like when i think about having a boundary um it just for me it feels like oh my gosh maybe this relationship is too hard it shouldn't be this hard but because i'm a psychologist and i've done a lot of work and i know this is family of origin stuff instead of allowing my nervous system to just be like let's just cut that drama out. I'm good vibes only. Like, I only want to be surrounded by people. I I mean, you know me. I do. And you've talked about how your tolerance for some of that strain in relationships is close to zip. And mine is like a hundred. Like, I'll engage over and over until I'm like, really sure I can't do it anymore. But when I... Which is probably a problem too, by the way. Well, and we're both (laughs) on very, you know, opposite sides of the spectrum in a way. But I think we're coming closer together. But just the idea that what I love about the rebranding, I'm I'm coming a little closer to Doug. Doug hasn't budged. I'm not budging. Anyway. <laughs> but the authenticity and the trust, if you can find the trust in the other person that they might be able to tolerate you speaking your truth, then they also get the gift of you being able to show up more authentically and not stifled or frustrated or resentful and that has been a beautiful 
transition for me and and this relationship i feel like has highlighted that the most (laughs) you're welcome thank you (laughs) so let's jump a little bit you have this amazing book Hmm. um and i love this conversation you know catherine this is why we kind of said this uh format that we develop and these interview questions are somewhat loose I have a million more questions for you. Like I'm imagining you on this farm. I'm imagining you developing a practice. I'm imagining you going to school after a significant loss. Um, is it's just kind of an amazing story. So there's so many pieces of that about your grief process that I wanna I wanna get into. And I don't know that we have all the time for that, but it probably is even part of what your mental health has been as you develop your own understanding of boundaries with other people. But go through a little overview. So you have four pillars of boundary setting. Go through those, and then we're going to specifically identify each and maybe talk a little Mm -hmm. bit more elaborately about each. Okay, so there's four pillars. And then after that, there's the implementation part. Sweet. So the first pillar is um, based in Brene Brown's work. It's Mm -hmm. what I'm okay with and what I I am not okay with. So that's her data. She, She took the data, and then what we do is look at the data And then we see how does that actually work with people in practice and how they can apply this. So the first thing that um, we notice is that um, people who are trying to set boundaries are just going to the person they need the boundary with and trying to discuss it with them rather than sitting back and say, okay, number one, why am I here? Mm. Why am I, why did I purchase this book? Why do I need to set boundaries? And then to really clearly have this conversation with yourself. So you're taking it from a thought form into language and then onto paper. And once you do that, it puts you on a path where you can start to really see yourself in a much deeper level. And then that comes as what am I truly okay with and what am I not okay with? Now that can be here today, right now, or it could be the bigger picture, like where do I see myself in 10 or 15 years? So, and this is all for you and it is flexible. So you can adjust this in any any way that you see. So sometimes you can work on some boundaries, some values, take your values, apply them into the second pillar, which is to take the values, the values become your boundaries and then you set the boundaries. The third one, and this is very important, and this is where things start to not go quite so well, is in order to have a boundary, remember the boundary is not for a person, it Mm. is for you, Mm -hmm. okay? And in order for that to go well, you have to have some kind of consequence. Now, these are with interpersonal boundaries, that means with you and another person. And the consequence is, okay, so you set a boundary, and then if, for example, um here here's this is a really harsh one is like if you cheat on me then my boundary is i'm i'm done i'm leaving that matches now let's say if you don't stop calling me after nine o'clock and i'm going to leave you that doesn't make sense so we really want to make sure that you get to decide on what the boundary is and a matching consequence that's very important because if you don't have a consequence then you are crossing your boundary. There is no boundary. So that's number three. Number four is the one that we'll end up talking about the most in, in, the, in my practice is what gets in the way of it? What behaviors, what emotions, what behaviors, and then the way we sabotage our mm. boundary. So those are the four main pillars of the book. I mean, that's that's fantastic. There's there's this one piece that I keep on trying to wrap my head around because it feels like such a different way of looking at boundaries. But it's the idea that you're not crossing my boundaries. I'm crossing my boundaries or I'm allowing those boundaries to be crossed. It really throws this idea of being able to point a finger that the other person is toxic like on its head, right? We, we're we the ones allowing this to happen and we can't just sit in this place of good guy, bad guy, that we have to own our own part in that. That yeah. feels pretty profound. It's pretty profound. I also think it's difficult. I mean, yes. it kind of goes back to identifying what you need different, right? And I think a lot of times we know when we don't feel good. I always tell people, you know, if you're, I'm, I'm going to go dating for a second, like, If you're dating somebody and you never quite feel restful, you never quite feel secure, Mm -hmm. you never quite feel 
comfortable discussing what it is that your experience is, if they're not asking about you, if it's not mutual, any anything that causes you anxiety or distress or discomfort on a, on a chronic basis. I mean, listen to that. It is devastating to our bodies and our minds when those things happen. And, and I always tell people, just really listen to yourself. Like, where is it in your body? What's going on in your body? Right? Absolutely. Because that's something that we do. I love that. I love hearing you say that, Doug. It's just that what is the physical reaction that I'm having here, especially in dating? And there's a whole yeah. section there that talks a little bit about like working with someone who's uh, on the narcissistic area if that's someone yeah i like the look there <laughs> <laughs> that boundaries with someone that is manipulating you you don't you know, recognize like in the first dating and in, in love bombing or sex bombing that happens right off the bat and then like it just feels so good and right. you are just shutting down all the warning signs that physically are, are happening to you that you should know better and then after six months or a year and you're in a committed relationship everything really is just gets toxic that's right, because they start leaking their ugly around five months in and their their charm isn't quite outweighing the red flags. I think we've all dated that guy, Dr. Catherine. Oh, I think we all have. <laughs> well, so the, let's dive in one by one. It sounds like journaling is, I mean, that's so interesting. So journaling seems to be a huge part of the very first pillar, which is what are my boundaries and what are my values and what's okay with me and what isn't okay with me. I mean, are there prompts in your book? What are, how do we even get there? It feels so big. Yes, absolutely. The book explains that you come up with an idea, like right off the top of your head, you can say, okay, these are my personal values. We have all different types of values, but we'll have family values, but we start with our personal values and we're not going to know all of them all at once. Mm -hmm. So you start jotting a couple things down and then the book is a nice size that you can carry it with you. And all of a sudden, like uh, you're thinking about this. Now you're focusing on what boundaries are important to me. And then the light bulb goes off. And you're like, oh, my God, that's a good one. And I'm like, write it down. Because if you're anything like me, is I have these great ideas <laughs> and come in quickly. And then just I'm like, oh, I'll remember that. And then all of a sudden, boom, they're gone. And I'm like, what was that? How, yes, how I can I relate to that. Thank God for notes on my iPhone. Yes. I do it oh, like if I'm up in the middle of the night and something's bothering me, I I start writing notes down and it always helps. I write texts to myself. Good. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like then you just it starts to build. This isn't like you you do this in a weekend. This starts to build and it's really starting to develop a relationship with yourself mm. and help your clear level so that you can set boundaries and that you do learn how to. Um, take care of your well-being. Very important. It's, For sure. It's incredible. It's like self-work and self-exploration, which is something that's a really hard first step for people. And, mm -hmm. and you know, one of the things, and you've referenced this, but it changes over time. Like, uh, as we go through life, as we have different needs, and I, you know, you we joke about how I don't struggle with being direct. I don't. But it took time. You know, when I was mm -hmm. younger, I, I wasn't doing that. I wasn't even aware of who I was as a gay man. I came out after I got married. So I, I wasn't aware of myself. I didn't even know how to do that. And for sure, Catherine, that came from my rural background and my upbringing and my parents not necessarily encouraging expression of myself in that very rural, very Catholic community. I didn't grow up Catholic, but um, right. moved into it. And it was it was something. Um, the second pillar, the actual boundary setting. So many questions about this because mm -hmm. I find a lot of my clients will want to get scripts from me, like, and I'll help them do it in a respectful way and one that observes their their feelings and and I does does identify that first part of value setting and like what it is that you need different. But you also talk about interpersonal versus interpersonal boundaries. Talk more. Mm -hmm. Talk more about that. So interpersonal means between you and another person. So if you have boundaries with another person, you have to have consequence. Now, interpersonal means with you and yourself. And we have yeah. these without even realizing it. For an mm. example, like um, I will always brush my teeth. I will always do that. That is an important boundary for me. If I don't brush my teeth, I don't need consequences for interpersonal. Oh, if I, yeah. have, I don't. I will get the consequences if I get McDonald's every day. I will have consequences. Uh, 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 vegetables, you know. Yep. The consequences uh, are your teeth falling out. 
Yeah. Yes. So we yes. have these boundaries and some of the boundaries we have to look at that we're setting, are they for us? Maybe it's time management. So Ooh. if I don't have good, healthy time management, then people may be taking advantage of my time. And then I'm angry at you because I'm not getting my work done, but it's I'm the one who doesn't have the time management. So when we're She's thinking good. about boundaries, think about both. It may just be interpersonal boundaries. It may be inner, but it may be a combination of both of them. And, and what it is isn't as important, but you'll notice whether or not you need consequences. And that's definitely directed with another person. But you also may need to start with some interpersonal boundaries before you can set interpersonal boundaries with the other person. It just depends on what stage you're at and where you're at. This is why it seems so inclusive for anybody to, to engage in that, in this work of boundary setting in yeah. a really healthy manner. So we're not just saying, okay, this is how you have to be. And this is how we say you should do it. Like follow this protocol. No, it's very, it, 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 it builds some self-worth. Uh, you're, uh, as you say, it's a lot of authenticity and it's really about our well-being. Which oftentimes, by the way, I mean, we talk about boundaries being for us, but oftentimes those boundaries will also help that other person, mm. you know, to not feel out of control either. That's what I've noticed oftentimes. There's a mutual benefit without even observing it. Mm. Catherine, what would you say to somebody or could you give an example maybe of how to balance compassion with staying solid and strong in what it is that you're needing? I think what's really important is that that is a type of compassion. Is yeah. It's like, because you are so important to me, I don't want to be angry with you. I don't want to be frustrated with you. I don't want to blame you. You know, I, I just want to feel love for you. And I just want to, you know, be good friends with you, whatever the relationship is. And, and a lot of it could be work related. I want to have good, I, if I'm working in a job with people, you know, five days a week or such, you know, I want to be able to get along in that area. So it is a t so setting boundaries is a type of se starts with self compassion, yep. and if we don't have self compassion, mm -hmm. it's very difficult for other people to have compassion for us. So they people will meet us where we're at. So if our self worth starts to come up, our self compassion starts to come up. Is that's where people will start to meet us? That is a boundary right there. I mean, yeah. I'm so curious. Um, about this piece of when we're doing our work, figuring out what's okay with us and what isn't okay with us. And it has to be from a place of self-compassion. But I know that I have a lot of people I work with. And I mean, the, me too, when I, when I ask myself, like, is this a reasonable boundary or am I being triggered? Is this old stuff? Is this, I just don't want to put up with it, but what they're asking for is reasonable. And how do we tease that apart a little bit in terms of like, I, that's a hard boundary for me, but it's not reasonable. Well, it, it may be reasonable. And that's kind of a tough question without like knowing the situation, but that's when we need to reach out for help. That's when it's really important to mm -hmm. reach out and get some kind of counseling, professional counseling. And if it gets to the point where you just need to figure this out and you're not going to know right away, it's kind of right. something that grows over time. Like think of it like for me, I'm a work in progress. Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe 15 years ago, my boundaries just didn't even exist. I didn't even know what the term was. And ever since I start studying it and I learn about it and every opportunity that I get to listen to any kind of mental health work and we just learn and grow. So this is like a, a working progress is a working yes. document. It's going to grow. Be patient with it. You're learning about yourself. And the more you learn, the more you learn. So, no, we don't always know the answers. And that's okay. I that's mean, okay. I love it. And it's also, it sounds like a time to reach out for professional help, which Doug and I could not agree more with. And, of course, if you ask your friends, they'll all give you a different answer about, you know, a panel of 100 neutral judges is sort of what you're maybe looking for someone without an agenda to just say like, well, I could see why you would want that, but they also have a right to blah, blah, blah. Um, the third pillar is the consequences. So you've put your boundaries out there and you want to make sure that the 
punishment, quote unquote, um, matches the crime, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't um, always think of it as a punishment because the consequences might be for my well-being. It's right. like here, like the example I used earlier, it's like if you're in a relationship and somebody's cheating on you, do you even know what your boundary is to begin with? Now, let's say, for right. example, that I have a hard boundary is like, um, okay, we're in a committed relationship and then I find you're cheating on me. There's no discussion. That's my boundary. That is rock solid. All right. That means I, whatever the consequence is, is that we are no longer together. That is all about me. That is for me. If you're having a problem with that and you're the one who cheated, then that's your problem. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say that I don't keep that consequence and I, I cross that line. I cross my own boundary. Then what happens is now I'm angry at you. Now I don't trust you. Now I am looking at your phone. Now I'm following you around. I mean, this is consumes my life. Mm -hmm. because, and it does, again, it comes from a place of, of hurt and pain and love and, and that we want something. But that's consuming me. That's my choice to choose to stay with someone who is cheating on me. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't some work that can be done and it was a mistake and then you can stay together. That's what counseling, couples counseling is I've for. I've seen it all the time. I've seen yeah. it so many times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But, and then what happens is, is that I'm angry at you because you cheated on me, but I'm the one who's crossing the boundary. Not you. You didn't cross my boundary. I, that's, you, you know, my boundary is no cheating and yours is you can cheat. <laughs> and so we don't have the same boundary. So right. that's why it's key to go back. Why do I want to be angry at somebody all the time? That's exhausting. I mm. want to have a good life. What, what's the, the number one thing people, when they come to get counseling and they say, you know, what would you like? And they say, well, I want to be happy. And, and how do you define that? And to me, that's how I define that is not being angry and resentful because I'm taking that out on you, but I'm choosing to stay with someone who is cheating on me. Oh, you know, it's so not good. always that simple. That's an extreme case. Let's say it's a boundary that you may need with, I'm saying you're an adult person and you're having a, your mother come in and try to manage your, teach you how to be a mother and take over the child rearing or something. That's a little bit difficult situation. You're not just going to get rid of your, your mother. But then again, the consequences have to match and we have to take time. We don't want to start with this discussion with mom. Because then it becomes angry. And right. then we're like, why don't you? And then we're fighting and we're using you words and mm. we're just attacking rather than saying, okay, let's just set the boundaries. And then, and, and then here's the consequences. Like if you don't do this, here's the consequence. You can't come over this afternoon after two o'clock. The answer is no. Again, this is all up to you. Right. It gives you a lot of autonomy and freedom. It is not us is professionals giving you advice, but just letting you see what works best in your life. You know, it's interesting. My head uh, goes so many different places when we have these sorts of conversations. I think about the boundaries that people need. We've talked about, obviously, the, the agreements that we have in our romantic relationships and if people cross those. But I think about the highly divisive nature of our, our culture right now, politically, and how do you engage with people who have differing views about mm -hmm. human equality or immigration or... You know, just generally how people treat each other, like what are those boundaries and what do you need in your conversations? Because I think so many, many people are coming in just really frustrated, like I cannot believe, you know, people are, are treating each other this way and how we're, we're treating each other in the in the political realm or what we're making fun of or whatever it is. It's really kind of just really not very golden rule uh, oriented. Um, I also think very seriously about like trauma. I went down that head of tra uh, that path of people who have been traumatized and the experience of what people will need in terms of boundaries will be different for those people. Very different. Right. Yeah. And so I'm looking at there's so many individualized and I want our listeners and our viewers to know this is so unique to each individual. We all come from different places. Some people are OK with open or poly relationships. Some people are not. Yes. And we all have different ways of doing this sexually, romantically, physically, emotionally, socially all of the ways that we engage in the world, we get to decide for us what works. And we can change it. Yeah. Maybe yep. at, it depends. You, know, you might have values as a 20 year old that you're not going to have values as a 40 year old. That's 100%. Right. Why can't these be flexible? I guess maybe like the ones, like I say, that are set in concrete are really not a lot, but they, but 
Yeah. Everything is flexible. You get to reevaluate where are you in your life right now. Right. So if I'm talking to somebody that's 21 versus someone that's 41, it's going to be a little different. And, and again, like you say, it's very, how does this fit with your culture and your background? You know, how do we respect that? It's so important to not give people the answers that may seem offensive but help yep. you figure out what we're, that's why we go back to pillar number one yep. is we can, we even as you're working through the book, go back to pillar number one all the time. What am I okay with? What are my values? That's right. You, you, you get into a relationship and you have a family and you were single before or the other way around. These things are going to change. So it is really nice to see it, that kind of empowerment that yes. you can get. This. That you so can change your own story along the way, because I'm also picturing the older we get and the more different scenarios we've seen, the more shades of gray. If before we get married, we're very black and white about what healthy looks like and what I will put up with and what I won't put up with. It's very obvious. And then you find out that your spouse yes. is a human with flaws and they have their own weird things. And like, how do we work with all of this? It gets more complicated the more shades of gray, the older we get. And I think we learn a lot too, is when you come in with your own background and the way you see the world, your, your worldview, uh, and we're listening to your stories and, and your values, it opens us up to, to be more compassionate as counselors. So mm. if you're a counselor, this is a great book to yep. help guide you. Yep. So we can open up and see people without watching for our own biases that may be getting in the way of somebody else's belief system. Mm. So it's very helpful for us, not just for the people that we're working with. Yeah. I also want to say, before we jump to the fourth pillar, um, I want to say that sometimes in the cons in the com conversation and communication that we have with people about boundaries, we learn something about them that helps us navigate maybe a different boundary than we might have initially yeah. thought might be necessary. Right. Interesting. So sometimes as you're talking and you hear from that other person, but you know, the, the reality is I have found myself sometimes, okay, now that I know that about you, I can, I can bend a little bit. I can go into a gray zone now. Right. Yeah. I, I had a really interesting, um, a gentleman that I work with and gave me permission to talk about this. I love it. Is that he owns a company and he was got the book and he loved it. And he goes, I started writing in here and about with his family, some family members. And all of a sudden he said, the light bulb went off. He says, I don't have a good relationship with my employees. I have no boundaries with them. They're walking all over me. <laughs> there you go. Yep. And he brought that back into the next session. And I'm like, wow. And he, he just was holding the book and you could see like the light bulb going off over his head. And it was such, he goes, I didn't even think of this. And he goes, can we talk about this? So we shifted the way that he drew boundaries with the employer employee relationship. And it took so much Rest off of him and was able to not have such a high turnover with his employees but that's what the the beauty of this is when you're writing this stuff down all of a sudden like you're like oh my god i didn't even think of this it's it's a huge self-discovery yeah. and, and a natural sense of curiosity is also something we're trying to develop with people so they're not we're not living through somebody else's script we're just seeing who we are and and that's the beauty of this. So it's very lovely in some ways to, to start to discover yourself. And then you, yeah. if you have self-compassion and then other compassion, instead of judging that mm -hmm. I'm the right way and they're the wrong way, you can just accept like, wow, we're wired differently. We feel differently about these things. There's nothing necessarily mm -hmm. wrong with the way they are in the world, but it might not be a great fit for what I need. This is what feeds my soul. Mm -hmm. That's the question. Is it is it like one of the questions you said is like, how do I know whether this is good or bad? But there's like the ego is like one that's thinking of, oh, how does this make me look? And sometimes mm -hmm. we get caught up in that. that not, that's not always a bad thing. I mean, it's not 100 percent either or. But if we're too much into worrying about what other people think, right. we aren't feeding our souls. What's our authentic selves? We're not really listening to us. And then again, we're, we're, we'll start to self-sabotage as you're talking about the, the next pillar gets into that part of it. Let's pillar jump in. All right. So let's talk about why boundaries are hard to maintain and what causes us to back up or question or sabotage, as you would put it. <laughs> yeah, this is a big one. And this is 
you know, we have a lot of compassion for people that are really starting to dip their toe into this. So there's three main things. There's your emotions that are going to come up, certain emotions, and there's certain behaviors that get in the way. And then there's a, a self-sabotage. And again, people don't realize they're doing this until we start pointing it out a mm. little bit. So one of the biggest ones that gets in the way emotion-wise is guilt. And the definition of guilt is I am doing something wrong. Like this feels selfish. I think that's the most common word I hear in my practice. It may be different in other areas of the world and the country, but um, this feels wrong to me. This feels selfish. Okay. And it's actually whenever we do something self-care, when we start it, there seems to be like so many things tugging at us that we always feel guilty about it. Like, like say you start, you got a family and you want to get healthy and you start like an exercise routine or a running routine and all of a sudden like work's tugging at you. Everything's tugging at your time, your kids, your spouse, whatever's going on. And, and then you're like, you feel guilty because you're taking away from everything. Mm. So that's what we do. When we start, notice this, when we start doing things that are good for ourselves, guilt, guilt comes right across quickly. Shame is another one that comes in. Um, the definition that I'll use here is um, like, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of this. I hear that with uh, a little bit more traumatized people who have more severe trauma and I had a woman that got into the first section and she started writing her values and she brought the book in and she started to cry. And I said, what's going on? And she said, and, and she was a little, she was an older woman. And she goes, I don't feel like I, I'm worthy of this, of to have these values. So that's right. where we had to go. We had to go right to that and back down and slow down and, and investigate that. And how do we develop where we feel worthy enough to have our values, let alone even starting to set, set the boundaries. And so then there's these behaviors that mm. come in, get in our way. And some of them may be like a blame mentality where we are saying, well, I'm angry because it's your fault, or this is all happening because of this or because of that, where we're always looking outside of ourselves is why things are happening instead of like we talked earlier about what is my responsibility in this dynamic of whatever I'm in? So looking at um, that's these are very painful things to look at. And it's hard to look at alone. It's better to be there with the, with a counselor that can help you kindly. But to see and acknowledge that I am when I've done this in my life, that I'm always blaming. Well, it's your fault that, you know, our relationship sucks because you're the mean person here, you mm -hmm. know, and you're the one who's this and you're the one who's that. Or it's it's just always something external. And to own that can be very painful. So, again, this is a very slow process. Helplessness is another one. Mm. Feel we're helpless. And when we work with patients, you can see in some parts of their life where they're not helpless at all. And, but then when it comes into some other parts of their life, they become very helpless. And we want to help them see that again, very kindly, because it's very painful to see that and own it. And then we can get past that. Because if you're strong in some areas of your life, we can help move that and transfer it into places where you're not feeling quite so strong. You may be feeling a little helpless. And then the last one is the big one where the self-sabotage, and this comes across in my practice quite a bit, is the way we talk to ourselves. Mm. And it's so harsh, and we are not consciously aware of this and pointing it out and then have people learn how to see it in themselves for example pay attention to the labels that you use against yourself what do you say that's unkind you call yourself stupid you know i mean i can like list a whole bunch of labels and we're not aware of it and they'll be sitting like in the office and i'll say do you notice that you just called yourself this or something as simple as oh you know what this is going to sound really stupid but so they're already setting themselves up to say that this doesn't sound good. It's, it's not very kind. And the way the language we use against ourselves and the labels that we use against ourselves, and then there's the behaviors that we have that harm us. Like, well, this just doesn't work. And then we'll go use, like, um, for me, I can go eat half the refrigerator or, you know, eat, 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 eat a 
pint of a gallon of ice cream or something. That's the type of self-sabotage mm. where that's connected to self-worth. It's like, so if we build, if we have boundaries, we, it builds our authenticity and our self-worth. And then we say, hey, you know what? I'm okay. I can get through this and I don't need to sabotage this. So that's a whole nother that's that's another book that's actually coming out. Oh, fantastic. it's about self kindness because this is such a big top topic. It's almost as big or bigger than needing boundaries. So that touches a little bit in the book. Wow. But that is the big reason how we can't set boundaries is the way we talk and see and view ourselves that we are not aware of. It feels like kind of the lesson in all of this, regardless of what might be sabotaging your boundaries, is that once we practice it and we start to feel better and we don't have as much strain in our world and stress in our world, that hopefully reinforces what we're doing. And so practice doesn't make necessarily perfect, but it definitely gets easier over time. Again, you know, it's fairly easy for me to let people know directly what I think and confront things that are difficult but it took me a lot of practice and i realize now if i don't say something it internalizes and it and it hurts me and i end up not eating i'm the, I'm the not eater part of uh, versus you know i i don't go to the fridge and eat the gallon i just don't eat um as my previous therapist will tell you so well, it's I like mean, a nervous system it is it's a oh it's a total to nervous discord. system response absolutely so it raises your anxiety and we all have our yeah. ways of of how, how do we make ourselves feel better? Because anxiety is in your body physically. It feels awful. And instead of working with it and seeing why, what's going on and what do I need to do? Maybe I need to be kinder to myself or set some boundaries. Yeah. We find a coping mechanism, which is usually substances. We might drink. We might, oh, we might even do behavioral issues where we're just sitting there scrolling yeah. for hours and hours and hours just to avoid ourselves. So these are all these ways that we can sabotage our well-being that can get in the way of our need to set boundaries just for because sure. we're just helping you see clearly. And so then gives you the autonomy to decide what works best for you. Which does, it goes along with thinking about all of this as we have to get to know ourselves as a work in progress first. And in the first pillar of what are my values and the last pillar of self-sabotage and the thoughts and behaviors and it all makes sense in that like we're probably also internalizing maybe our worst fear of what our original caregivers or people that are important to us are saying of like you shouldn't speak up for yourself because that's selfish or you're being ungrateful or you're causing a rift in the relationship yeah. or you're the one who does this and this and then if we don't feel like we are worthy of being treated the way we want to be treated, then those are the people that tend to avoid or swallow it down. I'm totally getting this book. It needs to be on my shelf. Um, Dr. Catherine, there are a few more questions that we had just about boundaries um, in general, and we just wanted to have your quick take on these. Um, so the first one is, what if we actually can't set a boundary because of the situation we're in? What if it's dangerous or what if we're, I don't know, financially dependent or what if I, don't, I can think of a million other that examples. That we're afraid of abuse or, or worse. It's violence, not a healthy right? enough situation or a safe enough situation. Absolutely. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't still do the work and see what boundaries you would want to set. Right. But you may have to look at the long term or the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. If you can't just like, you know, maybe like we're privileged enough in a situation where you can say, okay, no, this is done and I can walk away. But there's some situations that we, we don't know that you can't walk away and, and it could be dangerous for you to set a boundary. But it gives you the opportunity to look ahead and say, what's best for me? Where do I want to be? And then start planning there, mm. plan it out. So if you know what your values are and what you would like to have in a healthy relationship, then you can start to see how do I get there? Because mm. I can't just do this. Because if I do this, you know, I could get abused. What do I need to do? Who do I need to call? And, you know, because this is important to me, what we're just trying to get you to see is that you have value and that you're important. 
And yeah, we understand that there's all different, you know, extenuating situations and circumstances that are going to get into the way with us. And how can we help you with that? And you know what's interesting is sometimes what we're telling people now is it's not always about verbally communicating. It can also be mm -hmm. about going to a women's shelter for safety. It can also be about having a restraining order or a men's shelter or a person uh, who needs to be safe without necessarily mm -hmm. communicating that, which I've, you know, we've had previous guests mm -hmm. um, who have done that to get out of an abusive situation. So it's not always about confronting verbally. And I just right. want to make that point. Right. Um, let's talk about a complicated word called ultimatums. Um, what would you say da, about da, them? Da. Good, bad? I know my, my opinion is mixed. Um, I think it all, again, it depends. I, I don't, I use the term consequences because an ultimatum seems so like final. Well, yeah. Right. If and you don't do this, and one -sided I'm going to do that. that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then we say that, like we say, that if you don't do this, then, then that, and, but then we don't follow through. So if you're going to have an ultimatum, make sure that you know what, what the, what your consequences are going to be. Mm. From ultimatum. So, you know, we, we really need to kind of look at it. So I, I think consequences are again, for me, what is it that's going to say that so I can feel like I have the most safe, happiest life with the boundaries that's what the consequences are mm. again they're flexible they must match the boundary to be effective rather than having something as scary as an ultimatum but it doesn't mean that it isn't an ultimatum but that's probably would be more rare of a circumstance from from my experience but my my some of my boundaries is like um maybe like in the dating world like okay yeah this isn't going well you're scary blocking somebody that's that's about that's a, yeah. <laughs> so that's a sure. pretty good ultimatum yeah, yeah also, just like that yeah so i guess i guess the term that you want to use is is up to you but um that's why i was thinking consequences i don't really think i talk much about ultimatums but i can really can understand why people may see it as an ultimatum. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But it, it doesn't necessarily mean it because you can change your consequence. Again, remember, it's for you. The consequences for you, not against somebody. This is not against somebody because that's what they're doing to us. They're doing something, if they're doing something to us, like uh, abusing our time. Mm. We're not trying to match them and go against them. We're just trying to say, hey, no, this isn't okay with me. That's it. We're not trying to go after somebody. We're trying to come from a place of love and compassion, especially if you're someone that I, I love, you're a family member or somebody that's dear to me. I'm trying to build a, a better relationship with you, not make it worse. Well, I have another term that might be as scary to some as ultimatums, but I mean, what do you think about compromise? So you're in a position, you're brave enough to speak your truth with someone. You've done all the work on what are my values? What are mm -hmm. the lines I will not cross? What are the hills I'm willing to die on? And then this person, let's just say someone that you love, is telling you like, well, I can't do that. But what I can do is this. Mm -hmm. How do you sit with like, but I, that's my value well, and that's what I want. And what's interesting, you have the four pillars of uh, boundaries. I have four C's of relationships, compromise being one of them. Yes. Because I think it's critical. Please yes, elaborate for I you. Agree. I think that's the whole beauty of it is because once you know what your values are, you don't want to walk into that conversation without knowing what your values are. And then knowing what is your circumstances. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if you're in a marriage or, or some kind of a relationship, you know, absolutely. Then it comes into family values. What are, so you start with your personal values. Mm -hmm. That's where I start. Then the family values. Okay, how do, how do these work together? There has to be a compromise. You can't be with another human being without some kind of a compromise. Mm -hmm. And then you can pay attention to what you do the compromise. How is that working? What is that doing? If down the road, you're like still kind of feeling a little frustrated and angry at this person, at this, then it's time to reevaluate that. And again, then maybe that's us. Maybe it's us that's just kind of hanging on too tightly. And it's something that really doesn't matter. Let it go. You know, we don't know the answer. But in a lot of things for me personally, is, is, is it's a bit of a surrender where, you know, it isn't all about me. You know, maybe I need to be a little less selfish because, but, so but which means you're not narcissistic. 
That's You'll right. Come. Oh, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> we're all working. We're all a work we're in progress. We're well on that spec just a little bit, right? But, but no, oh we, my we, have to see, we have to see where we're at. You know, we're, we're, we need to step up and say, okay, um, selfish is not the term I like. I like self-focus where this is a time in my life that I need to focus on my well-being. I need to focus on my studies. I need yes. to focus on my work. I need to focus on my yeah. children. But there's a self-focus that if we forget about ourselves, then we're not the best role model for the people in our lives. That's right. And we're not even good partners or mothers right. or co-workers. We right. have if to I'm take care of ourselves. Then that's something to do. Maybe they need boundaries with me. You know, mm. I mean, maybe I'm one. So is it, it's just us having boundaries for us as well. Maybe they need boundaries with me. And then all of a sudden, just having this conversation Talking about, we've kind of gone through the book a little bit. The light all goes off. Well, maybe I'm the one who's <laughs> trying to cross somebody else's boundaries or something. And then I we, like we, that twist yeah. of plot right there. Wait, I'm the one who they're needing boundaries from. What am I doing? <laughs> yeah, and that's a very as you go through this, and that if if that comes up for you, that's very painful to acknowledge that. And we can see it, but the, the most important part is to own it. And then what can I do? That's what right. can I do to be a, a better part of this interaction in whatever interpersonal relationship type that you have? So, I love it. Oh. And as Doug and probably everyone else that has listened to us knows, what I always, always will say is that if you're not doing your work, everyone around you has to. And this is case in point. It can be really intimidating to look at yourself in the mirror and to think about like, oh, I might be the one who is doing these things that's making the relationship really challenging. Like it's not just this person's a yeah. villain because they're triggering me, but maybe there's something about the way I'm showing up that really yeah. isn't isn't working for the relationship. That is a very emotionally and physically painful experience. It still. Is. It's temporary. It, it's brief, but it's just yeah. like, it's like, oh, and, and it's very hard. I've gone through that myself and see how am I showing up in a relationship? Yep. You know, oh. and it was after the fact of where I had a relationship that ended and I was like, was so you know, frustrated and angry. And then after a while, I was like, wow, how is I showing up in that relationship? Right. And how is this a pattern for me? And how do I stop from bringing in this to another relationship? This is my pattern. Which and you've wow, basically was- described oh. why going to therapy is crucial. Like we, having a second set of eyes that's loving and compassionate with the only agenda being your wellness. Um, mm-hmm. Dr. Catherine, this has been such a wonderful conversation. We're so grateful that you came on to share your four pillars of boundary setting. And will you tell our listeners where they can find you, where they can find your book? Oh, absolutely. You can find my book wherever books are sold. And, you know, Amazon, is, is, you can get it. I think we have it in a um, couple different formats now. Um, you can find me. My website is katherinegcleveland.com. Everything, social media is all Catherine G. Cleveland. Okay. Sweet. Um, and one, we have a, I have a new book that's right now should be up in, a, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. And it's called Cultivating Gratitude. Ooh. Gr- gratefulness and Graciousness. Again, it's an interactive book and it's not just about talking about it is talking about how what gets in our way it's mm. very um, so and then the next one this is a series of books so there are series and the next one that's coming out is um kinder to myself and that goes to a whole understanding of bringing into awareness of how difficult and how hard we are on ourselves again these are all practice informed I'm writing about the most common topics mm-hmm. that come up over and over. I mean, not what's why they're coming up, everyone's individual, but then just seeing so many common things about human nature. And uh, it's, it's just, it's just so, um, I'm so grateful to be able to get out and share all of this information. And thank you so much for having me on. Thank Catherine, you thank you for joining on. us so much. And please take care of yourself. We look forward to another round. 
Oh, I look forward to it too. Thank you. Wasn't that amazing? I really loved the discussion as usual. There's no way to stay on course because so many other thoughts come up about mental health and relationships as it relates to the boundaries. But loved her. Really, really thoughtful. Um, I'm very excited that she has a couple more books coming out, one in two weeks. And so we should keep talking about those as they come up. Such crucial points. And I love the way she thought about boundaries. It's like such a a simple sort of overused word. But in order for us to get to a place where we're having honest conversations, even with ourselves, is really important. And one thing I was thinking about in retrospect when she was talking about, you know, your inner values versus your family values and how to even know what's yours and what someone else's. I mean, this we didn't even really talk about, but it just occurred to me. I was thinking about how when I was first dating Rob and I'm Jewish and he's Christian and how I thought that because of my family's values, I needed to make some stand about, well, I really need you to convert. That feels like a really important boundary for me. I want to be able to raise our children in the Jewish faith. That feels really important to me. And then the more, and Rob, first of all, no one has better boundaries than my husband, right? And he Um, says it in such like, he's very kind about his boundaries. Yeah, he is. Like, I'm not sure. I, I, I think. Maybe you need to be married to him. Well, I was just going to say, I think both he and I are really good at boundaries. <clears throat> yes, I agree. Right? Yep. I agree. Both of my husbands are really good at boundaries. And I'm a work in progress. But what I remember what Rob said to me is he was like, this is where the compromise comes in. He was like, well, I'm not going to convert, but we can raise the kids Jewish if that's meaningful for you. I will take an introductory to Judaism course if that's important to you. And... I remember thinking like my whole life, I thought that was going to be the hill that I was going to die on. But then I really had to sit with the possibility that that wasn't even my boundary as much as it was maybe out of obligation or guilt or something that I felt like I had to uphold for, you know, my Holocaust survivor ancestors and grandparents. And so that was a really interesting place in our marriage where I was like, I actually adore this person that is not a hill i want to die on and 25 years later it was a really beautiful choice so introduction to compromise which of course as always we want to hear from you do you have any stories any thoughts any feedback do you agree did you disagree we love hearing from you where can they contact us we might have some Instagrams, but also go to we're not yes. um, I think it's contact at we're not fine. If you have any questions whatsoever, we would love to hear from you. And we're going to start, you know, uh, putting some stuff on Instagram, just really encouraging people. If you have something you want to ask and have it discussed and have it communicated oh, about by two therapists, we would love to hear from you. So you can contact yes. us there uh, and the website. There's a very easy way to click. Very easy way to click. And yeah, we we will address anything. Do you have comments for us? Feedback? What do you have? What are you burning questions? We Bring us what you got. Bring us what you got. And then also it's contact at we'renotfine.com is our email. Find us on our socials. Douglas L. Jensen with an E-N. Dr. Talia Jackson. We're Not Fine Pod. We're also on YouTube, which... That is where more and we are like kind of killing it a little bit on YouTube. It's because everyone wants to see Doug's new scar. They want to see his dimple. They want to see what he's wearing. Um, also, I wanted to put out there Patreon. We are so excited about this. We're wanting to create community any way we can. We want to know you. We want to meet you. And the way we want to create community So through Patreon, you're able to just be a part of our community. You can subscribe at any level, free, $1, 5, 15, 25. And the hope is that we're going to be able to do more, better community events, retreats, workshops. We want to be putting out there more bonus content, invite you into our world. We want to do Q&A sessions, lives vlogs so we're rolling out all of these beautiful benefits 
And also, this is just for the people that are still listening to us, to us, which might be our truest, truest fans, but we are in the market for someone that is a rock star that would like an internship about from like what is it promo marketing pr we need someone who is not a therapist who has oodles of time and energy that wants to connect us in the world because that's not our jam we're just good at what we're good at but we're looking to expand our team by one special person so with and above that all said, thank you for listening that was a lot of information. That was a lot of information. I think I stopped listening five minutes ago. I'm kidding. I uh, always know when Doug glazes over and he looks through the camera. Yep, that's what he looks like. Yep. Drool starts to form on the side of his goatee. So we're not fine, but <laughs> not a clue. <laughs> at least you weren't hit by a two by four. At least in your face. You weren't hit by a two by four in your face. Wow, that's so original. Did like you come I was. up with that? At least your response time is faster than someone who was hit by a 2x4 in the face. Love you guys! See you next time. <laughs>